Hi, I'm Kai Wright. I'm the host of the United States of Anxiety from WNYC. We're both a podcast and a radio show. And I am also the host of this conversation we're about to have about the intersection of art and democracy, but in particular, the intersection of poetry and democracy. For me, one of the places where it intersects most, where all of these things come together most, is in bringing my full self to my political thought and my political engagement. That's what democracy is, after all. And it's easy to show up to those with just your heart or just your mind or just your soul, but to bring all three. That's what art helps us do, to engage on all those levels, and that's what poetry in particular helps me do. Uh, I learned this in a perhaps unexpected way. I, um, I learned it on Twitter. <laughs> it's not a place that... Uh, many of us think about for coming together, let alone bringing our full heart and soul. But that is where I found it as a consequence of the fact that I have filled my Twitter feed happenstance, through happenstance, accidentally. I filled my Twitter feed with a bunch of novelists and historians and poets. And so there are some mornings where I, like most journalists, will sit down at my computer and go looking for the latest news and be on Twitter and instead be finding myself just kind of picking that scab of bad news, uh, picking that scab of like frustration with other human beings. And somebody on there, particularly on the days when there is like a lot of bad news, somebody on there will say, hey, cut it out. Stop this. Go read some poetry right now. And that's how I came across Jericho Brown, for instance. I was not uh, following Jericho Brown's work, I'm ashamed to say. Uh, and someone one morning was like, hey, go read some Jericho Brown. And I've now made that a practice. It's part of how I start a lot of my days is I sit with poetry, particularly Jericho, uh, but a range of poets and try to bring my full heart, my full self into whatever is going to happen that day that we're going to do together, that I'm going to try to encourage people to do together through my work as a journalist. So that's what we're going to talk about for this segment. We're going to talk about the ways in which poetry can, in fact, bring us all together, bring our full bodies into a political conversation. And I am thrilled to begin that by introducing you to Richard Blanco and Mahogany L. Brown. Hello. Hi. <laughs> so any conversation about art and democracy, certainly poetry and democracy right now, I guess would have to start with the inauguration, um, given how big of a moment it was uh, at Joe Biden's inauguration when Amanda Gorman uh, offered her incredible reading Richard, you have stood at that very same podium. Um, you were asked to write and read a poem for Barack Obama's second inauguration in 2013. Can you give some insight of what that's like as a poet to be you know, both crafting and delivering that poem in that moment? Sure, and I think that's right on top of the, uh, for today. Uh, I think that was for me the genesis of really understanding uh, the connection between poetry and 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 democracy and public discourse or civic discourse, mm -hmm. um, you know, just to just to be just to be present and represent not only uh, bring my story and my narrative into this American narrative of our democracy, but also all the people I realized I represented indirectly or directly, I guess, all the emails mm -hmm. I got from people just saying they felt for the first time part of this country. And until that point, I just kind of thought, well, you know, I got to be honest. I was like, yeah, you know, poetry's not for everybody. Uh, you know, I didn't really <laughs> understand the power that poetry could have when it's given that kind of platform. It's arguably the most public and perhaps uh, the one of the most, I guess, political, I guess, moments in poetry in America where 40 million people are reading a poem. So, And it changed my writing and it changed my sense of what poetry could do in the world or, or my own role as a as a poet and in discourse or as as a, the civic role of the poet if you will um and it was powerful for that very reason because of just that feeling embraced by america but also embracing america back and understanding most importantly that the story is not over right that this is still a work in progress yeah. that i have work to do that we all have work to do um in our own ways to keep on writing this story i have to say, ask you said it changed your writing how so um, you know, I had never considered myself a, a, a political writer per se, uh, simply because I grew up in a very politically charged climate of Miami. 
And so uh, I guess being apolitical in a way is being political, but but uh, it just uh, opened up uh, it opened up a bigger question to me about home and identity that was not just about my own Cuban Americanness or my queerness, but rather who are we as a country, right? And mm. and thinking about those there, it gave me permission in a way to dive into other spaces um, that I felt needed poetry and that I could speak uh, speak with, not for or to, but with. Mahogany, I, I joked in my introduction to this panel that uh, I have turned to Twitter for poetry. Um, from, from That's where I found the intersection of poetry and democracy, um, and that that was an unlikely place. But actually, your work and your career, you've had a very robust engagement with this, with social media in general, as a place where we exchange art and exchange ideas. Um, and so I just want to ask you about that. You know, you turned the idea of black girl magic uh, into a, you know, a book link poem. Uh, you wrote a book of love tweets. Uh, what have you learned about how art and poetry and specifically can interact with this space where so much of democracy takes place? Um, thank you for that question. What I've learned is uh, Twitter does not have edits still, turns out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you have to say what you mean. And if you don't mean what you say, you have to apologize for the thing, right? So if anything, I'm learning that the art that we put into these spaces needs to be uh, with intention. And, it, and it, it's going to come with some kind of deliberation, whether you're ready for it or not. Mm. So what better way to have a conversation, to learn who you are, to learn what you want your poems to do, how you want your art to reach the world, than to have it exist online, where you come into, into in touch with so many different walks of life, right? Uh, there is no one um, individual person or kind of person that you will meet on a platform like Twitter or TikTok or Instagram. Facebook is a little more curated but those other spaces are wide open. So your conversation uh, is going to be varied, vast, um, and sometimes it'll cut you down if you don't know what mm. you're talking about. It will, it will make you feel like <laughs> smaller than when you began uh, if, if you don't mean what you're saying, right? Uh, some people go in and they're strong and wrong, but I'm, I'm always interested in how the art evolves us. Is the mm -hmm. art telling the truth? Even if it's a truth that is painful to bear witness to, um, are you upset about what you're witnessing? And if so, are you complicit, right? Mm. So it's asking all these different things at the same time. And I'm okay with those, those hard discussions and I'm willing to be wrong. Um, I would rather uh, leave room to grow than to think I'm right about every single thing. The art, specifically the poem, is the one place where we get to ask all the questions. The poem is where you ask the questions. Mm. Uh, how we deal with each other is a response to those questions. It's so interesting that leave, leave room to grow. And it just it feels like poetry is also a place that, that encourages me to leave room to grow. Um, that's, that's one of the places. What about uh, art in general and poetry specifically as a mobilizing force, I, I wonder, Mahogany, because there's so many, I mean, I guess social movements have always used art as part of what brings people together in, in, in the act of, you know, I consider a social movement an act of democracy. Um, but it seems like the Black Lives Matter movement in particular, mm -hmm. um, artists um, and you know, poets, songwriters have been such an important part of the movement. Mm -hmm. I wonder just your thoughts on poetry as literally a mobilizing force in democracy. What I love about poetry is that it's always been, it's always been here. The ways in which your pastor speaks, the ways in which the leaders speak at the protest, all of those are, are uh, employing poetic language, the, the, the figurative devices that we use in poetry. So poetry has always been, that's what raises your heartbeat. That's what gets the blood pumping. That's what makes you remember uh, whatever memory it is, right? Like there's there's something attached to your ownness that will come back because someone says something like bodega. And if I say bodega in Brooklyn, Richard's gonna get something from bodega in, in Miami, feel me? And, and that is the, that's what you want to happen with poetry. We have to uh, remember that poetry is not just uh, a language of self-expression, but it is also um, 
it's riotous in its, in its ability to give voice to those who have been silenced for so long. Riotous, Ooh. riotous poetry, I love that. Uh, Richard, it, it's also a place for healing. You have, you have turned to poetry in this way, or you have offered the nation poetry uh, for healing in a couple of different uh, environments. You've, you've written uh, poems about the mass shooting in El Paso, uh, about the Boston Marathon bombing, it seems like you draw upon these moments in your work to sort of help society through through trauma. Is that true? Is it is it something you're drawn to do in the first place, or did that just happen? Um, and can you talk about how how you think about it? Sure. I mean, I think I've always come to the page. Um, you know, I, many of us as poets come to the page first with our own sort of healing that needs to happen, right? Um, and then that healing um, that healing becomes public, and that healing becomes shared. And it's just like Mahogany was sharing, was sharing with us, it kind of becomes like, oh, wait, you too. I, I think it was Jane Hirschfield that said something like, you know, poetry is just a hand that says me too, right? And says, mm -hmm. here I am. And we offer what we've learned from our lives as a gift uh, to others um, in some ways. But also uh, healing and in more, more, more in that sense of these more, uh, these more public poems or uh, broader poems, Again, back to what Mahogany was saying, I've always felt that poetry is kind of has always been traditionally since hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, the village voice, right? The thing around which people come together, the proverbial campfire, the song, right? Um, and like music, it has the power to sort of collectively collect, do something collectively. And one of those things is healing, healing through understanding, healing through reflection. Um, I like Mahogany was saying, which, I mean, why do we go to church, you know? Like, to reflect. Yeah. So it's, poetry can do many different things in many different contexts. And certainly this is one of them, um, uh, how we can sort of just take a pause, reflect, heal, um, take inventory collectively. Um, not all my poems are that, you know, that, that collective and that broader or aimed to have such reach. But certainly I found, like I said earlier, I found uh, there's great opportunity for poetry to do that and, and has done in the past. Um, but, um, but I think there's, there's a time, you know, there's a time now more than, more than in my lifetime that we really need poetry in, in that capacity. Um, yeah. There's, there's yeah. a lot, there's a lot out there that we, we need to, we need to meet, we need to meet about it. Like, you know, meet, meet at the poem. Yes, <laughs> uh, meet at the, the meeting, poem. Um, that's the meeting tree. Yeah. And I love that you said that about healing. I also believe healing is revolutionary. Who mm. else love themselves the way Poets find a way to love themselves. Even in the most downtrodden moments, there is this reclamation of space of who we want to be, of who we remembered ourselves as. And that is revolutionary. That text is revolutionary text because how can you find love in the midst of so much oppression? How can you find love and hope and, 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 and want some kind of like connection um, in a time of a pandemic, but through art? That's revolutionary at its finest. Whew. Well, yeah. that feels like an appropriate segue to hear some art uh, because we are still in the middle of this pandemic. I've, I've, I've had a pandemic heavy day, frankly, uh, and I think I could yeah. use some healing. So, um, Mahogany, would you, would you be willing to share a piece of your work off of that thought? I would love to, thank you. I'm going to read a poem that I wrote for Sister Sonia Sanchez, and it's in three parts. The first is a cento, which you know is creating a poem from lyrics already written. Um, and these are all lines from poems, her poems uh, that changed my life. And then the second is of course the thesis. And then the third is the response. One, forgive me if I laugh. You are so sure of love. You are so young and I am too old to learn. Can you tell the morning stars, the air so sweet, river dark with sound, speech and breath? Can you tell the stars and the ocean, she is a holy one, leaving trail of witnesses smiling, amen. A woman, our braided spaces, glass gone mad, yellow razor thin light, shiny sugar and pure woman, conceal a symphonic shudder, a thousand sermons, conjugated pain, wild stars, southern eyes bloom in the night. We taste the blue midnight stars between my teeth. Black magic is you, 
caught in my voice. It is a wild sea. Love shifts the air and we blossom black. Picture a woman, her spine, her rotating the earth, her leaning into our birth cloud eyes, jumping rivers, inhaling moons. Imagine her, free, two. I ain't known I was worth the snarl and spit. This name, this black girl gone, black woman arrival. I ain't never known I was worth fighting for until I read a Sonia Sanchez poem. Three. We roll up sleeves and bend from the knees. We sing beneath our breath, it's gonna be heavy. We still swing big despite the justice system of letdown and we still show up on time. We arms open, we hands open, we hearts open, and we love the way we fight. Until empty, until sun replenishes until laughter fills the well, until a black baby grows without fear, we return to the front line. We hammer, we hatchet, we ready and ready to love a life, we ready and ready to rock a stone cold gaze into dust. The black girl you watched harassed is someone's daughter. The black woman you watched berated is someone's daughter. There is no redemption in swinging out of your weight class. There is no glory in the demise of our black women. We be the daughters. We be the bridge makers. We be the pot servers. We be the cleanup crew. We be the aunties. We be the writers. We be the spell weavers. We be the holiest of holy. We pray for you. We double-edged women, we gather like a fist of freedom papers. We coal of storm and glory. We a country surrounded by ghosts. We pray for ourselves. We watch our sisters pray for we. We blessed in this knowing. We black palms open and up. We black spirit and divine. We ain't never been steel bars. We ain't never been glass ceilings. We ain't never shuck now. We saunter, we saunter, we saunter the testimony. We clean, we clean, we clean the spirit. We manifest, we manifest, and we ain't leaving. I said, we ain't leaving till we choose. We be the daughters and we got root work to do. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Richard, would, would you also share a piece? Sure, first of all, amen, a woman. <laughs> uh, that, that's good. Uh, thank you for that. I, I, I'm inspired by that uh, to read also a, sort of a, a, a poem to another woman, uh, much closer to me, uh, my mother. <laughs> A um, couple of things about this poem. Uh, this was the, the, the White House had actually write, made, asked me to write three poems for the inauguration. So I thought since we started the conversation, I'd read this one. Um, and then what Mahogany's poem says to me too also is that poetry is a way of having a conversation with the past, the present and the future. Uh, in this case, through Sonia Sanchez. In this case, through my mother's story, a woman who left her entire family behind in Cuba for the sake of the ideals and promises of this country and letting us see this country through her eyes and thinking about how we might to step up what we need to step up in order if we knew if we well now we kind of know what's more at stake <laughs> than when i wrote this poem so here it is uh mother country or madre patria to love a country as if we've lost one 1968 my mother leaves cuba for america a scene i imagine as is standing in her place one foot inside a plane destined for a country she knew only as a name, a color on a map, or glossy photos from drugstore magazines. Her other foot anchored to her platform of her patria, her hand clutched around one suitcase, taking only what she needs most, hand-colored photographs of her family, her wedding veil, the doorknob of her house, a jar of dirt from her backyard, goodbye letters she won't open for years. The stall for drone of engines, one last deep breath, a familiar air she'll take with her. One last glimpse at all she'd ever known. The palm trees wave goodbye as she steps onto the plane. The mountains shrink from her eyes as she lifts off into another life to love a country. As if we've lost one. I hear her 
once upon a time, reading picture books over my shoulder at bedtime, both of us learning English, sounding out words as strange as the talking animals and fair-haired princes in their pages. I taste her first attempts at macaroni and cheese, but with chorizo and peppers, and her shame over Thanksgiving turkeys always dry, but countered by her perfect pork benil and garlic yuca, I smell, I smell the rain of those mornings huddled as one under one umbrella, waiting for the bus to her 10 hour days at the cash register. And at night, the of her sewing her own blouses and quinceanera dresses for her grown nieces still in Cuba, guessing at their sizes. And the gowns she sell to neighbors to save for a rusty white sedan, no hubcaps, no air conditioning, sweating all the way through our first vacation to Florida theme parks to love a country. As if we've lost one. As if we're you on a plane departing from America forever. Clouds closing like curtains on your country, the last scene in which you're a madman scribbling the names of your favorite flowers, trees, and birds you'd never see again. Your address and phone number you'd never use again. The color of your father's hair and your mother's eyes, terrified you could somehow, someday, forget these. To love a country. As if I was my mother last spring, hobbling, insisting I help her climb all the way up to the US Capitol, as if she were here before you today instead of me, explaining her tears, her cheeks pink as the cherry blossoms coloring the air that day, when she stopped, turned to me, and said, you know me, home. it isn't where you're born that matters, it's where you choose to die. That is your country. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Richard. Mm, my heart just lurched. Our women, our women in our lives. <laughs> oh, so good. I love the I love how you pay homage, but I also love like that that final line, that that final line is a cliff dive. Like, oi, you don't even realize the choices you make until, you know? Yeah. Until and, you're and gone. I, and, and then so that too. That too was country. Oh that. I see all that. Um and uh, so and in, I always say my mother's more of an American than I could ever be in that sense. Um, <laughs> because see, you know, we take we've as we've learned, we sometimes take our, our liberties or freedoms for granted. And democracy is a very fragile thing. I, I hate this idea that we live in a democracy. No, we are working in a democracy. <laughs> the democracy is not a one-off, right? <laughs> it's yeah. gotta be, it's work, it's constant. It's, you don't it's get a there. verb. Check, yes. God, it's a it's verb, a verb. Not a noun. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, like so yeah. many things, there are so many verbs we have turned into nouns in, in, in our culture. Uh, well, on that note, before I let you guys go, can I ask each of you just, you know, we are in this really pregnant moment where it seems like we both were either facing a moment of incredible opportunity to re at rebirth uh, at new things, at coming back from pain and doing something different as individuals and as a society, are at falling off the precipice. <laughs> and it's not clear to me on one day the next where what actually the next thing is. And I wonder how that feeling shows up in each of your work, just quickly as we wrap up. How, do you, how, do, how, are, you, how are you bringing this current moment, the complexity of this current moment into your art right now? <laughs> Mahogany, why don't you start? You look like you've got, oh, you've got something on top of That's why I start laughing, I'm like, uh. So I actually contracted COVID-19 in March, literally a year ago. And it took me after the two weeks down where I thought I was not going to make it. Um, it took me another eight weeks to regain my sense of taste and smell. Mm. Uh, the one thing that uh, came back first was my, like, my mind. It was so foggy before I couldn't even figure out how to get to the restroom. It was like that difficult. Uh, so what this time has has uh, informed me of, reminded me of, is that I don't have time to play uh, with the niceties. Um, if we are truly uh, fighting for justice 
and um, <laughs> verbs, right? If we're working for the verbs and not just the noun, then we have to do the work and we can't be afraid of, of the blowback of what telling the truth might look like. So I've started writing with more fever than I had before, I think. Before mm -hmm. I was more concerned about, you know, I don't wanna be too rough and seem too, you know, off-putting. And now I don't care. Like if you don't like what I'm saying, okay, but I'm going to say it because I literally was on death's doorstep and I recognize yeah. that me playing nice will not save us, right? Audre Lorde said, your silence will not protect you. And, and that has been on all accords. That's on all fronts, all of us. If we are silent, we are complicit. So I refuse to be. And now my art responds with that same urgency. Thank you. Richard, closing thought on, on how this moment shows up in your work. Sure, um, definitely, um, definitely uh, every ditto. <laughs> but the idea of being witness is so powerful in poetry, in poetry too, and witness says so much. Um, I'm always thinking, um, of course, uh, what a year, right? Or well, what, what a few years, but um, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm always thinking somewhat, somewhat uh, with a somewhat comically how when, when things are going good, right? Poets are looking like what's going wrong, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Like, what are we not looking at? And, and then when things are really, when the S really hits the fan, <laughs> we start looking for rays of hope, right? Uh, of mm -hmm. course, acknowledging the present. And so um, I wrote a pandemic poem, uh, which was very hard to do because in a sense, I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm in the middle of this moving target. And so I had to search for hope, like Mahogany was talking about. So, you know, how, how do we find love? How do we find strength in the middle of this insanity? Um, and it was one of the hardest poems I had to write. So that's what I'm trying to do is sort of like thinking about, thinking about also being an emotional historian and recording this time because I don't want us to forget. I don't want us to sort of, I don't want to forget, first of all. I want to take our lessons forward. Let's not, let's not, you know, go five steps backward, you know, next year once everybody's vaccinated and blah, 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 or, or you know, or, you know, um, whatever, you, you know how, you know how it goes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can easily sort of slip back and so, I feel uh, I feel that providing some amount of hope is showing up, uh, looking past the moment, but also recording the moments that we we um, we don't forget the the lessons learned or where we are right now. Recording the emotional history and telling the truth, no matter how hard it is, seem like great places to stop and great things for us to take away. Thank you so much, Mahogany and Richard, for this time. Thank, Thank you. you. This has been great. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> yes, anytime and always. I want that <laughs> pandemic poem. Let me see it. <laughs> I'll send it. I'll send it to you. I'll send it to you. <laughs> the world wants it, Richard. <laughs> yes.